Thank you. And uh, morning. Welcome, everybody. Still a few more seconds to let more people come in. Um, should I stay or should I go is the subtitle of this talk and the subject is of course core, .NET Core or perhaps a subset ASP.NET Core. Uh, it's an interesting story about uh, what is really core if it's just .NET or simply ASP.NET. We'll talk uh, about that but the question I'll try to provide an answer in the next hour should I stay or should I go is essentially should I stay with what I use today to write my uh, essentially web applications or should I go and jump on the newest and coolest bandwagon should I go with uh, .NET Core and ASP.NET Core as far as uh, web applications uh, are concerned. So this is essentially the purpose uh, of the presentation. All in all, I would say that the view I have, if I move in the middle of the stage, I have a view of view and offers me a semicircular auditorium with uh, a high concentration, high density of people right in the middle and this massively huge auditorium is for the most part, I would say, approximately half or even two-thirds empty. That's the same metaphor I see for ASP.NET and .NET Core. There is, in some area of functionality, so for people writing and working on certain types of applications, there is a high density of interest for this new cool thing called core, but the silent majority of people has nearly no interest or very low interest and is for the most part, are for the most part people confused by the poor communication, total lack of documentation, and more importantly by the fact that Microsoft embarked in this, uh, let's call it feat, changing completely the approach with customers that made, that built the myth of Microsoft. Microsoft grew as uh, the giant we know because uh, of the easy to use, user-friendly tools, and now they switched to command line tools. And uh, some people, like Morris, say, but no, tangently say, well, there's still Visual Studio, and if you don't like command line tools, you can stop, you can just ignore those tools and keep on doing things, keep on doing your business, your application development in the same way, except that under the hood, but transparently to us developers, command line tools, console applications are being used. And when you realize this, so there, you, you hear about the new cool, the, the new runtime environment, the new command line tools, uh, Bauer got this or that, and then you say, well, but it's hidden under the buried, it's buried under Visual Studio, and if you like Visual Studio, the Visual Studio experience, nothing changes. So what is the point then? of core. But yet core is hot, very hot these days. And uh, yeah, and conferences, uh, public events are about core because anyway there is a curiosity at the very minimum. I'm really afraid to ask how many are here because of the high interest you have in core or because you are simply curious. I'm afraid to ask, and that reminds me of this popular movie, everything you always wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to ask. And we can rephrase the movie 
with my face like this. Well, I, I, honestly, I'm not an expert in sex, so it's better replace sex with .NET Core. Everything you always wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. What's really cool then in Core? Let's try to find out. The untold story of .NET Core and or ASP.NET. Once upon a time, all fairy tales become, begun, begins like this. Once upon a time, Microsoft, a company called Microsoft, built a huge amount of money, a crazy amount of money and success around the Windows operating system. At some point in this fairy tale, after decades of successful activity, something started changing. It was not everybody's fault. It was just that things go at some point in a different way. So the Windows operating system was pushed aside by the facts, by the real world, and something else appeared from the sky called the cloud and Azure. So Microsoft is, in a way, facing a sort of a, a transi business transition from a model in which Windows was at the, c the center of the universe and most of the money came through the operating system, the central operating system, to a different model in which everything is centered into Azure. And Azure is a host. And uh, it makes sense for a host like Azure not to be limited to one particular environment and one particular operating system. We also assisted to weird things like Microsoft loving Linux because of Azure. I mean, do you remember that not that many years ago, I mean, at least in Italy, you could not go to on stage talking mobile or even web mobile and show something that was not a Windows phone or a Microsoft approved device. Even as an individual working for Microsoft Italy, you were not allowed to buy an iPhone <laughs> because iPhone, ugh, it's iPhone, iPhone. Oh, you could mention Linux. You could mention Linux. That was a policy. You could mention Linux publicly in an event that printed with the Microsoft logo. You could mention Linux only to disregard Linux. And now Microsoft loves Linux. That's the power of money. <sighs> okay, let's ignore this. So, concretely, what does it mean? At the end of the day, Microsoft is simply looking for new customers. It's money. New customers, more customers to bring to Asia. That's it. This is the real, as I see things, of course, this is a personal opinion. This is how I see things. Microsoft is simply looking for new or more customers to bring to Asia because Asia is the way they used to make money now. Yeah, the power of money. So the future of Microsoft is all in bringing as many people as possible to the cloud and subsequently everything they have. And Microsoft is still a company that allows you to build software. So everything they have to build software must be redesigned to play well with and within the cloud. So it, it started from here. Let's rewrite the web framework we have so that it looks nicer, cool, attractive, enticing, alluring to developers uh, not using currently our products. This is what they said. So let's look at what they do in Python, in Ruby, in Node.js, and let's try to offer the same experience to them so that we, we can prove that, we, that they can do the same work with the same experience using our own products. And when they use ASP.NET, it's easier for us to bring them to Asia, and we can keep getting money from new customers. And then they realize, yes, but people, is not completely, people are not completely stupid. Uh, 
because if they are using now Node.js or Linux or things we don't have and that we uh, regularly disregarded, they won't come to Azure. So we have, we need to offer them a way to keep on doing their own business, even Node.js, even Linux, but on Azure. That's the magic of cross everything, cross PC, cross, cross whatever. So they start and say, what well, we have for web development? We have ASP.NET. ASP.NET, the current one, was designed, the runtime was designed in the winter of 1997. It, it, it changed a little bit over the years, but it still was based on the idea that Scott Guthrie had, his own words, in the Christmas time of 1997. In 1997, uh, I was married. Yes, I was already married. Oh my God, I was married. Uh, but I had no kids yet. And my kids now, now are of age. So it was 19 years ago. So it was about time that they re redesigned from scratch the runtime environment for web applications. And they realized, okay, we, we redesigned, but what can we offer? We need to offer an extremely lightweight environment, getting rid of whatever is not strictly needed, and give people the chance to bring in the runtime environment, whatever they need, all and if they need it. So you just pull from the cloud the service you need so that you can fine tune the footprint, the memory footprint of your web runtime environment and the cost in terms of memory and resources of processing every single request. This is what it means redesigned to play well and in the cloud. Oh, it's another personal thought and reflection. The Microsoft culture also changed significantly in the past, I would say, 10 years. Not that many years ago, and if you want an example, I can tell by the time that Microsoft pushed out Entity Framework, the, first, the very first Entity Framework in 2007, 2008, they approached the development of their first ORM with the idea, we are Microsoft, the people we hire, no matter the background, just because they've been hired by us and work now for us, they know how to do things. And in fact, Entity Framework 1 was a wonderful product that was completely disliked by the every single developer on the planet. Remember the doc, the public manifesto vote of no confidence on Entity Framework? It was true to me. Check it out. They switched it to something that is completely opposite. Others always know how to do things. We can only copy. <laughs> so it's a total turnover. And no, no, no JS in this plate. A key role. So as far as web is concerned, in the Microsoft space, we had Web Forms, which was a fantastic product by the time it was created. Then we had NVC. And NVC was there, not because there was a strict need of it, but simply because others were doing that. We're doing web that way, so let's offer them, let's prove people not currently using ASP.NET, but loving the MVC pattern, that we, they, we can put them in the condition of doing the same also on Microsoft. And core is just the next, ASP.NET core is just the next step in this. Let enable people to work on our platform the way they do on other platforms so ASP.NET Core was initially conceived to be just the cool new version of ASP.NET. But the goal changed along the way because they realized that to make, to bring people to Azure, they actually needed a completely cross-platform, host-independent, 
environment for building applications. So a new foundation for .NET, a new .NET. They realize that. In much the same way, I mean, I have gray hair, not really much hair, actually, but so this is to say that I've been in this business for over 20 years, and I remember very well the other big transition from Win32 to .NET. Even ASP.NET started like this. I mentioned uh, Scott Gottry and uh, the very first flower, okay, that originated ASP.NET. I mean, he presented that in 1999 publicly, and it was called ASP Plus. ASP Active Server Pages, which was the standard of the time for web development on the Microsoft space. So ASP Plus. So it was a new runtime, richer, better, based on compiled code versus VBScript interpreted code that was the standard in ASP plus. And they started with the idea of building a better Active Server Pages environment, and they ended up creating a different Win32, object-oriented, language-independent, the .NET environment. And they then integrated the ASP new runtime into the new .NET. The same pattern that we can observe these days. And uh, the fact that it was uh, a long story with uh, many, many, many changes is witnessed by the numbering. So we had uh, 10,000 so different betas, thousands of RC, and hundreds at least of RTMs. They, it's a story, recent story. In November, they announced RC1, and RC means release candidate number one. So technically, if, unless there is a horrible feedback from people, we don't change this, and it turns into RTM. And RTM, for me, means release to manufacture. So, ready. In between RC1 and RC2, which was published in mid-May, so six months later, they changed quite a bit of things, and more importantly, completely changed the perspective and expectations. There are news. There was a question asked to Morris at the end of the session about Project JSON. Project JSON is gone. I mean, for three years, gurus, oh, not me, eh? not me, other gurus populated the web with articles, posts, and talks about how cool it is to have JSON to express the nature of the project, and now it's gone. <laughs> it's gone because they didn't realize that it doesn't work that well with MS Build. Some people said that it's also a war between teams. Whatever is the reason, Project JSON is now there, will be there in RTM, but it's gone. It won't be there in the, the, in the post RTM1 version. So you see the, the <laughs> they cannot be serious. They cannot be serious. So they are still to release RTM, one of a product, and they are telling everybody that, it's, that it will change everything in the future. So why people should take into serious account core now? And still, RTM is going to be out in a few weeks or maybe a couple of months, and still it will have no support for Visual Basic, no support for F Sharp, no support for Signal R. This will come, but later. Now, there is nothing, really nothing, in ASP.NET Core that addresses directly the real challenges of modern web development, at least. 
based on my personal experience, which means JavaScript, client-side development, mobile stuff. Microsoft never realized that is critical for web applications, server-side server or client-side, to detect or, or to, to know about the, 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 the characteristics of the device. Every other company knows that. Google has a framework. Facebook has a framework. Every giant of social networks have a framework or use a framework to do that. Microsoft doesn't offer a social service, but offers tooling for building potentially social services. And they, in their communication, in their articles, in their, in their, yeah, in their developer websites, there's no mention for how critical is detecting mobile device capabilities. Uh, modern web development is also about architecture, about understanding the domain, about user experience. These are the real challenges of modern web development. You can incidentally mention in a shameless plug for my latest book. I'm sorry about that. So more serious, modern web facts and answers. JavaScript, Microsoft says, well, we don't care. You just use the frameworks you like. Well, this is not a bad answer, honestly. Microsoft tried a few years ago to create, to avoid jQuery, to ignore jQuery. And it was only in 2010 in which they said, it was a public announcement, one of the biggest, uh, I think it was the biggest first announcement by Scott Guthrie when he started making building his huge and well-deserved career, he said, well, Microsoft now stops any development in their own jQuery, and we just embrace and support jQuery. So it took years to realize that, OK? Uh, so they say, now, use the frameworks you like. We, don't, we are not going to offer you any other framework. Uh, well, this is not actually a bad answer. Mobile stuff, they say, use responsive web design. This is a horrible answer. Because responsive web design is really helpful, but it's first aid. And I'm not saying that everybody should be doing device detection. I'm simply saying that developers must be educated to know about the limitations of responsive web design has a methodology, period. If you are, as a, as a company, making your living out of offering tools for building apps and web apps, at the very minimum in your communication, in much the same way you say, use every JavaScript, and we support every JavaScript framework you, you love, Angular, React, jQuery, whatever, Bootstrap, whatever, in much the same way, they should say, be aware that remote responsive web design has some issues that, by the way, I will cover in the OLIJS conference on Sunday. But be aware of other frameworks and the role of device detection. Compact architecture, they say, apply the design you like. And they never realized, nobody in Microsoft realized about a layer called the application layer. Every piece of code you see has the controller and the repositories within the controller, which is stupid. But it's stupid not because uh, using repositories directly from the controller is wrong per se. That's not the point. Sometimes I, 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 ha I don't mind using repositories from within the controller. The point is, the communication, you are not educating developers. Because the message is, every data you save, you persistently save in a database, and that you retrieve through repository is all the data you need. They miss the point that in modern, real-world applications, the model you use for display is typically significantly different today 
from the model you use to persist data. It's the essence of polyglot persistence. This is the, the, the point that I don't like when I see repositories within controllers. It's not the technicality of the class. It's the, it's the hidden part. It's the architecture, design part. Apply the design you like, right. In fact, I don't do that. I apply the design I like, but I'm not, from the Microsoft perspective, educating developers. And I would expect this to be a responsibility from a company that provides tools for building apps. User experience, apply the principles you like, great. Again, here, user experience is tightly coupled to the fact that you must be dealing with models on the view side different from the persistence side. I mean, for, for many years, you only had to create an effective relational model and the data, the tables, the, the, the records you had saved and persisted in SQL Server, Oracle, or whatever, they were exactly the same chunks of data you would display. But today is no longer. For most applications, it's no longer the case. So there's the, the answer, apply the principles you like, is not a valid answer. So there is nothing like this, not even in the communication in .NET Core. And these are the answers that make modern applications really modern and effective. And then we have the IAS and Visual Studio experience. A generation, at least one generation of developers built using the Microsoft stack web applications, publishing on IAS and using Visual Studio. And now, are they totally wrong? Should everybody ignore overnight IAS? I mean, companies, enterprises, have an IT department. They have people who work there, who have built their own skills over here. They know customers. You cannot say, oh, now we can. Well, it's good to know that, OK, I can publish my ASP.NET apps on Apache. That's good to have. But not at the cost of making the life of IAS experts, IT experts, harder when it comes to new ASP.NET applications. I mean, I see that Microsoft missed completely the impact of the new thing on the existing customer base. And the existing customer base, like this room, is much larger and silent than the few people interested in the, the, the cool new thing that yell and scream a lot. So it's good to have an alternative in terms of command line, in terms of hosting, a different hosting model, but not at the cost of making the current experience on the current tools worse. So, core is an effort, probably midway effort of making the entire Microsoft spec, stack cross PC, Mac, li, Linux, Windows, um, I mean, I mean the hardware, platform, operating system, and tools. This is .NET Core, and there is no ASP now. So in the end, at the very end of the day, the untold story of .NET Core and ASP.NET Core is the story of a new .NET foundation entirely cross-platform, cross-framework, cross-whatever, that can work regardless. Okay, and I, I don't want, even want to recall that not that many years ago, Microsoft made a point of tightly integrating ASP.NET and IAS. Still today, if you open up IAS and you try to configure an application pool, you see integrated pipeline. That is 
the sign that uh, of the total turn turnaround a vision, which is not bad, it happens, but it's a total turnaround. So I integrated pipeline, which is, we, are, we, we still use, which ensures that ASP.NET applications, the runtime is the same as the runtime of IIS, is a, is a thing that we have today that was, that was pushed as the top of care for people choosing the Microsoft platform today is tomorrow would be wrong. I mean, I recall that in the very beginning, ASP.NET had an architecture very similar to the architecture of core. So the ASP.NET runtime, so the, the modules, the handlers, the, the middleware, what is called today the middleware, was still in ASP.NET originally, and that was running in a separate process, in a separate exit process another console application. That was in 2001, 2002. It was uh, a few years later that they started with uh, IIS, uh, IIS 7. They started moving that runtime implementation in an executable W3WP within IIS. And they called this integrated pipeline. Now they split again, and they split again because they have the goal of supporting any other web server or abstracting the services they get from a web server, which makes sense, total sense. But it's not what we have today. And the, the challenge now that they, Microsoft is finally realizing, and we'll see the light in concrete code post RTM, is that they cannot afford building a new a new foundation for .NET at the expenses of current enterprises having made a significant investment in the current technology. That creates a little thing called legacy code. .NET Core will inevitably create a lot of legacy code. Any code you have becomes legacy. And if you are an enterprise, this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem anyway. And it's tightly related to the concept of a technical debt. Imagine you are a bank. You have your million small and less small apps that you use for running your business. My, and, they are, and you are a Microsoft vendor, a Microsoft shop. Okay, now they release a new framework, what should you do? Should you really afford stopping your business for a couple of years? Rewrite everything? No way. Crazy. No way. And if you don't do that, you keep on using your apps, the technology goes ahead. And because the technology makes progresses, it increases automatically your technical depth, the distance, the gap between your current technology and the front end of the technology, which is a problem anyway. And there's no solution. Even beyond the joke that every code after it compiles the first time is legacy, even beyond that, it's a serious point. Things that nobody mentions. How hard is to port existing code to core, to what we know today to be core? Nobody mentions existing Entity Framework code. It's based on Entity Framework 5 or 6, which is not supported in core. So it means that you could create a, a web application that runs under the new runtime environment, but still is not leveraging the .NET Core smaller framework. It still needs to bind to the full .NET framework. So you change the runtime environment, but you lose a lot of the benefits and the speed and the performance 
that is, that advocates use as the, oh, that's why you need to go there. What about existing security layers? If you use SP.NET identity, the tr transition is the same. So identity is well supported, it's integrated in core, it's been ported to core. So changes are nothing or very minimal. But if you have your own membership system, consider that if today you use, you handle authentication cookies, let's consider a very basic example directly. So you have your own membership system that stops working. It has to be rewritten completely. The concepts are nearly the same, yet there is still something called the authentication cookie. There is still something called the, the login URL. There is still something called the timeout and, and whatever. But the real code has to be rewritten and there is no documentation at all, at the moment at least. What about if you have custom libraries? Everything must become a NuGet package. If you, if you don't have a NuGet package for that, or if the existing NuGet package is not updated, Consider that if you have a, your own DLL and you don't have the source code for that, you have to wrap up that in a fake NuGet package in order to compile into a core project. At the end of the day, it means that every project that needs to be ported, even the simplest, has uh, days of work just to make it able to compile. And I'm talking about uh, the silly, stupid pages that I use as a demo for my book. It took me over a week for just single page in the sense that one view application. So no knowledge, nothing because of the cost of the configuration, the cost of learning new things, for doing the same tasks you would do at no cost and in zero time today, that is a cost for companies. So every developer, even the smartest, has to be retrained. And now, here the point is for a company is not that the developer is so geek, so geeky and so gang-ho to spend free time, any spare time learning things new, not part of the everyday work. You may have as a company very valid, extremely skilled developers that use the tools that are relevant for the company and the frameworks are relevant for the company. Th these tools are not core. So even the smartest developers you have must be retrained. And it's a cost in terms of money and in terms of time. Still a cost. It's a huge cost for companies. And this is what nobody mentions yet. It's something that I started. We can argue whether the TOB index, the algorithm, which nobody knows, is uh, valid and not valid, but let's assume it is. What we see there is that Visual Basic, and I mean VB6, is still number 13, and if you remove from the list languages like Delphi or Perl or Ruby or PHP or Python or Java, it's the fourth most popular language in the Microsoft stack. DB6. And this is confirmed beyond the TOB index. This is confirmed by my personal experience. When I run architecture classes, most of the customers admit they are trying to learn modern architecture practice because they have to rebuild, rewrite, re-architect parts of the company systems in which they have components still running VB6. Because of the trade-off. Go to a manager and try to so we have to rewrite this component or this subsystem, this microservice, to use a core because core is newer and it's cooler, we want to use that. Okay, the manager may say, how much it takes? Oh, well, it may take a year. How much it costs? Million dollars. For what? 
Oh, for, for being able to do the same things. Th that's the answer. <laughs> And Microsoft, thanks God, realized that. Uh, .NET Core is highly intrusive, as it is today. Much more than .NET was 15 years ago, because the world is different, because customers are different from developers, and customers do their own business using software. For customers, software is a tool, is a mean, is not the essence. And this is the article, May 2000, May, May 27, so last week. Blogs, MSDN, Microsoft.com, whatever it is. Now, based on this conversation, as well as our experience working with first and third party partners, we have decided to drastically simplify the porting effort by unifying the core APIs with other .NET platforms, blah, 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 blah. To drastically simplify the porting effort. Whatever we have done so far is bullshit. As I, this is how I, I translate that. And this announcement, 27 May, from blogsmsdn.com, came less than two weeks after RC2, the day in which they released RC2 and announced RTM. So RTM will come soon, but will means nothing compared to longer terms. And here is the Oh My God series, part one. Oh, look, all the text you see now comes from that article, are quotes from the previous article. Okay, so it's not... Are not, these are not my words. Okay, this is Microsoft's words from that article. It became clear that adopting .NET Core would require existing .NET developers to spend a considerable amount of time to pour to it. Oh my God, please. Oh my God. <laughs> While there is a certainly some value in presenting new customers with a cleaner API, it dispropor I can even pronounce that. <laughs> disproportionately penalized our existing loyal customers who have invested over many years in using the APIs and technology, we, advert we advertised to them. Oh my God. We want to extend the reach of the .NET platform and gain new customers. Oh, sounds familiar. But we can't do so at the expense of existing users. Oh my God. And this is a picture of a, uh, a slide that was presented at Build, which represents the future, but not today, the, the future. Post RTM, when, when it will be done, it will look like this, but not, not now, and not even in RTM. The process to extend the API surface of .NET Core like that will come after we ship .NET Core 1 RTM. <laughs> and why do you want to ship .NET Core 1 RTM then? <laughs> that reminds me Silverlight 1.0. When uh, Microsoft decade, a decade ago released the Silverlight One, there was a lot of people, oh, beautiful, fantastic, wonderful, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, okay, wh what can I really do with that? So I was interviewed for Donna Rocks at the time, and then I said, uh, and they were so excited about Silverlight, they asked my opinion, and I said, well, it's a fantastic tool to build animated GIFs. <laughs> that was it. Honestly, that was it. You, you couldn't do more than that with Silverlight 1. Silverlight 2 was a different story. But Silverlight 1 was a tool, fantastic, for building animated GIFs. The Oh My God series part 3. Here is the promise we want to make to you. Whether you need to build a desktop application, a mobile app, a website, or a micro, even a microservice, <laughs> cool. you can rely on .NET to get you there. And this is understandable. 
code sharing is as easy as possible because we provide a un we will provide we will provide a unified base class library as a developer you can focus on the features and technologies that are specific to the you use a bullshit of advertising i don't know what it means oh my god seriously uh, there is a something called the dictatorship of the instant that is a uh, uh, a way that some people use, some philosophers uh, use to comment uh, the impact of web and social networks on everyday life. So, uh, the essence of uh, the, uh, the philosophy, dictatorship of the instant is that the moment something is announced is perceived to be real, existing, and working. Uh, in politics, this is very common. They we will do we we do this and they just the announcement nothing follows no action typically follows but yes um, even in technology the dictatorship of the instant is uh, is common but anyway the good news in this is that Microsoft acquired Xamarin and uh, reasonably in the same MSDN article they mention the Xamarin pattern which means essentially the fact that. They say, uh, we should copy from, uh, adopt the same pattern that Xamarin used when they built uh, MonoTouch first for iOS, for Android, and then uh, the, the Xamarin Studio and uh, the frameworks that we use today for building mobile apps. They did not start reimagining the .NET stack, but they just took uh, Mono, which was nearly identical to .NET, removed the .NET application components like Windows Forms, ASP.NET, and they added analogous models on top of the core for iOS and Android. And this is essentially the idea. The .NET standard library of the future will be, a, will, will be the .NET core common, and on top of that, specific adaptation implementations for WPF, Windows Forms, ASP.NET, Core, Universal Windows, and then the Xamarin part, iOS, Android, and uh, Mac OS. So in the end, let's be honest, and let me be frank, even though my name is Dino, I'm not frank, but I want to be frank. Uh, transitioning to a completely new platform is not free. And you have to calculate five years from end to end. It all started in 2014 with early discussions dating back to 2013. So it's at least at least two more years to go to see something serious that companies and people can realistically use. I believe that you won't be ready for prime time for two more years. Of course, I'm here and I'm happy to be, to be wrong, to be proven wrong. Exceptions are possible, but I would say that at the very, very minimum, we have to wait .NET Core 2 to start looking seriously into that, which is perfectly in line with the history of your Microsoft. Never use a Microsoft product until version three. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I'm not sure that .NET Core 2.0 will see the light, but that's my own forecast before second half of next year. Five years in the end, that's it. Now, if you are in particular conditions, because you know there is, and the green part is another quote from the article, .NET Core works well now for the scenarios we set out to address. It provides access to fewer technologies than other .NET platforms, especially the .NET framework. So now, if you now fit in those scenarios, if really system web is your biggest problem, if IAS is your biggest problem, if you 
realize you, that you spend in the cloud a lot of money because of the memory footprint of every single request, okay, then you might want to seriously consider now .NET Core. But if not, my best from the bottom of my heart, just wait until it stabilizes. This is a mass read article, blogs, msdi, microsoft.com, .NET, blah, 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 making it easier to port to .NET Core. It's an announcement made last week. I'm a tennis fanatic, John Macro. You know, remember the story when in Wimbledon, when he was complaining to the umpire, the ball is out, no, the ball is in, the ball is out, no, the ball is in. You cannot be serious. That's what he said. Thank you very much for your time.